Okay, love and blessings. So today we're going to continue the exploration of the mother book. Welcome, Mindy. Welcome, Shanti. And that, Shanti. Not everybody knows everybody. So the idea of the mother book, the principle of the mother book, is how to collaborate with being with a teacher, a realized being, who is a channel for what the Mother Book calls grace. A transmission, a dynamic expression of the original truth coming into creation, Satchitananda. So the grace is Satchitananda. It is that which brings existence alive. It brings existence into existence the knowingness and the quality of presence, the self-awareness, and the bliss of being, the delight of being. This is actually one stream, one current. And it may come into our systems in different ways, but it's all pervading. We live in the, in the current continuously, everything living does. But when you're around the teacher, the current gets organized, it gets focused, it gets channeled, and it becomes a transformative force that allows the consciousness of us that's tied into our identity as a person, as a human being, with a life and a story, to begin to separate itself from that identification. And it begins to strengthen its ability to know its own existence. Essentially, consciousness becoming aware of itself as consciousness. This is the essence of the whole spiritual path. And the process of us disengaging from our habitual identification with our person, with our personality, with our body and our story, <clears throat> this allows for that person that we are to move into alignment with the quality of consciousness that we are in a way that's not possible because Otherwise, because we're unwittingly feeding the belief in our thought, belief in our feeling, the belief in our story as being real and true. And as soon as we, the quality of us as consciousness begins to withdraw its identification, the body can then automatically become a more capable instrument or channel for this dynamic expression of the divine principle the mother books calls grace. So everything in the mother book is about how to consciously collaborate where the process actually wants to happen if we would just get out of the way. If we would just could let go. If we could just move into the correct relationship with it so that it could do its work. And there's something we can do. We come to the spiritual path because a quality of us that is truth itself comes to the surface of our personality. It may be coded by the story of our human life, it may be coded by the trauma or the experiences, the events of our life, the impressions we gathered when we took on the body, but it is actually awakening of a quality of being that lays latent, that lies latent in all of self-aware beings on the planet. And that itself is divine. We are that. Our essential quality of being is that. We drop away from our habitual orientation to our mind and our emotions and our moods and our sensations and our preferences. What's left over is that essential quality of divinity that each of us are an expression of. Sri Aurobindo in his work discovered that there was a force that was trying to enter the collective consciousness that had a greater capacity to bring about a fundamental shift in the collective consciousness. That it would not just work in our awareness or in the mental plane, it wouldn't just work in our heart, our emotional plane, it would work in the very cellular structure of our bodies. It would begin to release 
the evolutionary error that each cell of our body carries and cause a, from the inside out, a reorganization of the very vessel that we have been occupying, such that under our very feet, without us at first knowing it, we are becoming divine. We are being undone from the inside out relative to what we've used as our error, as our separative sense of identity, our ignorance, our limitations. So this inside-out quality of the transformation is what Sherabindo discovered, and he called this force the supermental. And at the time he created this, he brought, he, opened, he created a channel for this force. I know what this force is. I call it Satri. I call it the dynamic expression of the eternal, unchanging potentiality. It is the Shri, the the movement of the creation coming from this huge potentiality. And it carries with it a form of Shakti that is, has a much greater effectiveness and intensity than the form lesser forms of the Shakti force or the Satchitananda force or the grace. They're all describing the same principles. So this effective force, he noticed, could be brought into the creation. A channel he opened in the uh, in the embryo in the em- membrane that has held the creation into existence. He created an opening so that this what he called supermental, my teacher called the cosmic, what others call the gunatic force, <coughs> which I call the satri force, beyond the creation, to come into the creation and very convert the sattva into itself, the rajas into sattva, and the tamas into rajas. An extraordinary accelerant in the possibility of the evolution of consciousness the development of spirituality. This acceleration is occurring now. It's what awakened me. It's what awakened people that were awakening before I awakened. It's the cause of all the kundalini awakenings. It's the cause of this greater expansive interest in things spiritual, in yoga. It's creating the receptivity for the thing that we're talking about now, such that now it is actually vigorously working in the collective consciousness, trying to enter more deeply into the evolutionary structure of all of existence. This is why the planet's heating up. This is why the consequences of things are becoming more apparent. It's why things are not as hidden. It's why people, uh, manipulators of power cannot hold on to their power for lifetimes after lifetimes, there is this revealing, this opening, this revelatory process, which is the awakening of not just us human beings, but the earth itself. This is what he was saying. A literally a new foundational structure for matter than one that has been possible up to now. So what he was doing was creating people who could act as channels for this force. He was his work was intentionally to increase the capacity of the people who were coming to them. At first just a few, and then in the twenties, and then in the hundreds, and later even in the thousands. But those who were with him when he was alive with the mother were the ones who could most directly benefit from the opportunity he was creating because his form was a channel. The mother's form became a channel in the process of her association with him. So at least there was two of them. And then many of the people who lived with him became channels. Although there was no fanfare, there was no recognition, there was no (coughs) certification. And this unseen effort in the collective consciousness has opened up the possibility that we have before us right here, right now. That's for all of you who have come to me and in which I am the conscious channel instrument of. So my job is the same as Shura Bindo. 
is to create more people who are capable of bringing in this gunatic force, this force that's beyond the creation, this incredibly powerful, effective, transformative force that can shift the very basis of reality from the inside out. It's different than other practices, other teachers and other teachings. It's not about enlightenment, it's not about awakening, it's not about realization, it's not about you going off and being recognized as a teacher. These are all byproducts of your willingness and capacity to become a conscious channel for this force into the creation. So in these next two chapters of the mother book, Shri Bindo becomes more gentle than he was in the first chapter. In the first chapter, he calls it on us. He requires us to come up to the task and to start dismantling the parts of us that are in resistance or opposition to this force. These next chapters are actually talking about how to move into alignment with a force, with a grace, that's actually trying to come. And that there's something about this being able to move into alignment that has us begin to realize the very deeply satisfying principle of what we call grace is this benevolent holding of us. This moving into the recognition that the world is not out to get you or destroy you or make you miserable, that there is in fact nothing to fear, that is all part of a necessary process to bring forward a possibility of being that when it comes is the most wonderful, most awesome, most indescribably true and fulfilling recognition of what you are that one could imagine beyond death, beyond birth, beyond anything that we have been able to access as human beings. So, let's begin. In all that is done in the universe, the divine through his Shakti is behind all action, but he is veiled by his Yoga Maya and works through the ego of the Jiva in the lower nature. In yoga, also, it is the divine who is the Sadaka and the Sadhana, it is his Shakti with her light, power, knowledge, consciousness, Ananda, acting upon the Adhara, and when it is opened to her, pouring into it with these divine forces that makes the sadhana possible. But so long as the lower nature is active, the personal effort of the sadhaka remains necessary. So in this first verse, you're you're being introduced to Charabindo's languaging. Um, but it's also expression of the cosmology, his recognition of how things work. And part of it has to do with the recognition that even our ego, the adhara, is an expression of the divinity itself. And that our longing or aspiration for God is itself an expression of the divinity within ourselves. So that that is all an expression of this one principle trying to come into existence. And the only problem is the error of our identification with the vehicle that we're inhabiting, that we've woken up in. The habit of the personality, the habit of the mental thinking, of the emotional reacting, and the vital drives and our embodiment that makes us believe we're a separate being from all other beings. It's an error. It's just an error. It's not an error that's real. It's simply an error in perception. It's an error in context, in how you hold it, in how you see it. That it's the divinity itself that's seeking its expression as you. The universe is constantly struggling to manifest itself as you. 
This is the principle. So he uses the words Shakti <coughs> and Yoga Maya and the ego, the ego of the jiva in the lower nature. <coughs> These are all part of his cosmology, his languaging that addresses this principle that we find, this structure, this machinery that we find ourselves entangled with unknowingly. The principle of the sat in creation is the purusha or the shiva. Those are the words, Sanskrit words, or the brahman. And the brahman and the parapurusha and the shiva are all words for the same principle. It is that unchanging stillness and silence, that foundational quality of presence that's unshakable, like a rock, a rock of consciousness, grounded in its own reality, not needing a world to be grounded. And then there is the Pakriti. Pakriti is the manifesting principle of that purusha. It's the one that is the action of the Satchitananda. It is the action of the Satchri. And that we can access as divine. We can call it the Supreme Being. We can call it the Divine Mother. We can call it as the Parashakti. We can call it any of these terms, but it's all just pointing to the very same principle, the dynamic expression of that eternal unchanging presence. It's the two together that allows us to know we exist. The Purusha is the foundation of our I amness, and the Shakti is the expression of our existence, of our beingness. We carry both qualities, each of us individually, are an expression of these two principles of the Purusha and the Prakriti, or the divine in his as he's languaging, he's using the purusha, calling it divine as a his, <clears throat> and the shakti as a her. But these are simply arbitrary languaging. It is simply one principle, which we can look at as feminine or masculine. So the shakti is the grace. It's what comes into this creation for the purpose of manifesting itself through each of us. This creation is actually ultimately benign. It brings exactly what needs to be brought to each of us in order for us to be able to meet it, to learn how to become into relationship with what it is that we don't want to be with and not get addicted to the things we do want to be with, to move into relation, the true relationship to what it is to be a person, to exist, to have a body, to have feelings, to have thoughts to have drives. And in that relationship, we then move into connection with this divine principle, this divinity, this grace. And the feeling of the grace, when it comes, is wonderful. It's as if you're being held, as if all your worries have been taken away, that you're in the brace, in the arms of the divine itself. And that quality of love is what gives us the strength, it gives us the willingness to start stepping out of the habit of our person, the habit of our ego, to begin to collaborate with the process that the universe is trying to show us, but we've not been up until now able to be with it. Thinking, no, I can't have it this way, or yes, I want it this way, and I want to hang on to it. This moving into the correct relationship is what the Mother Book is talking about. The quality of the adhara, the ego. Adhara means ego. It's the I amness. It's associated with the self and awareness. When a person awakens and they wake up out of their ego identity and they become the context, they become the space in which their ego arises, or where their person, the content of their person arises, that quality is the adhara, the knowingness, the intelligence that can step out of content, step out of subjectivity and become objective about the subject. This quality of awakened consciousness is the jiva. 
We all have that as a component of us as part of our expression of our Purusha, our Shiva. And then we have the heart, the embodied quality of ourself. That is the being. This is what Ashura Bindo called it, the psychic being. It is not the Adhara, it's a quality of beingness. And the being is much more connected to itself in the body. It's much more connected to the whole range of feeling, sensation, including thought, in a, in a truer way than one when we're locked up in ego, locked up in identification, locked up into attachment, attraction and repulsion, preference, fear, anger, need. So this quality of beingness is what responds to the grace. And it's felt more tangibly in our body and in our heart. So the Adhara, however, is the one that can consciously choose to collaborate with the process. The being in us, the Shakti in us, is the receiver that receives the transmission of the grace. It brings peace. It brings calmness. It brings silence to the restlessness of our nature. It's a felt experience, not just a detached objectivity. And when the Adhara is open to her pouring into it with these divine forces that make the sadhana possible. These divine forces. The universe delegates. Once there is the original Shakti and then there are all the beings and energy fields and entities that are the agents for that original divine Shakti bringing this force down, down, down into the, di the, the dimension of our embodiment. Each having a different vibration, a different influence. When these forces are allowed to enter into the person of us, they do the transformation. They are the ones that makes us want to meditate, to wake up in the morning, to find a teacher, to understand what it is that you're experiencing or what you're learning, to how to move into collaboration with the process. It's these forces these that, that come through these agencies, these beings. You could call it Christ or Vishnu, Krishna. You could call it <coughs> Buddha or Muhammad. You could call it a number, it's had innumerable names. All teachers, all realized beings are in themselves emanations of this original Shakti, as I am. And each brings a certain quadrant. It depends where the consciousness rests in its journey towards the Absolute. If it attains all the way to the Absolute, then it can be a transmitting channel for the original, what the Shiravindo called supermental force, to come into the creation. If it's not, it can be a channel of the, the grace, or the love, or the wisdom, or the clarity each of these are expressions of the same principle, Satchitananda, coming into existence. So when these start able to ent enter into our person, it sets in motion a transformational process. That means literally a reworking of the cellular structure, a reworking of the f organization of the need or want or fear structures. It is like a, a cure-all for all that causes misery and suffering for our human embodiment, in our human embodiment. And it begins to relax the structures of separation and control and me versus you and the endless conflict and battling that goes on with this. It begins to relax from the inside out. This actually works all the way down to the cellular transformation. Those of you who have had this experience where the forces that occur become so intense you go into these altered states, these samadhis or savakal samadhis and you begin to experience as if you're being worked on by forces or entities in the subtle world and they're changing parts of you. I had one time where I saw my body with the entire floating 
and the entire backside, all the skin was gone, and these intelligent but not self-aware, almost mechanical forces were literally working on my body from the undersea, from behind, from my back, into the cells, into the organs. This would happen multiple times. Or literally there was this tangible uh, intervention occurring through these semi-autonomous, intelligent, in that particular vision, uh, machines that were literally re- rebuilding, reworking this particular system. So I saw it. My teacher first came, when I first came to the ashram, he says, I'm going to take you apart and redo every part of you and then put you back together. He was right. That was my experience, being token of taken apart and then put back together in a new way. So there's so much mystery we don't have access to, us human beings in our narrow little mind, sensory perspective. We not, can't know all these dimensions, but we can have faith in the force, in the grace, in our own experience of our relationship with this transmission that comes. It is this that makes the sadhana possible. We can't do this alone. And the first chapter said two forces were required, grace from above and the aspiration from below. Aspiration isn't ours, it's not our egos. The aspiration is the divinity within us finding itself, meeting itself, coming down as the grace. Or it's the divinity within itself calling for the grace to come in. The personal effort required is a triple labor of aspiration, rejection, and surrender. An aspiration vigilant, constant, and ceasing. The mind's will, the heart seeking. The ascent to the vital being. The will to open and make plastic. The physical consciousness and nature. Rejection of the movements of the lower nature. Rejection of the mind's ideas, opinions, preferences, habits, constructions, so that the true knowledge may find free room in a silent mind. Rejection of the vital nature's desires, demands, cravings, sensations, passions, selfishness, pride, arrogance, lust, greed, jealousy, envy, hostility to the truth, so that the true power and joy may pour from above into a calm, large, strong, and consecrated vital being. So he just spells it out. <laughs> Makes it clear. In case you couldn't recognize yourself in these descriptors, <laughs> you could begin to understand the application of the three tools that he's giving in this chapter. Aspiration, rejection, and surrender. <clears throat> Aspiration and surrender is not enough. There has to be rejection. Rejection of that which is not aligned. Rejection of that which opposes and resistance. This this recognition how all these three together are really even a more effective tool to realize that you are unwittingly hanging on to parts of these things listed either to be right, or a habit, or to your conditioning, or your cultural orientation, without knowing you're hanging on to them. So you you have to first find yourself doing it. Find yourself caught up in a negative pattern. Find yourself being overtaken by reactivity, or a positionality, or any of these things that are being described. You first find it, and then you have to pry it your consciousness loose from that piece of you that you were lost in, absorbed in. And when you pry it loose from you, you throw it away. Mm-hmm. You, you learn to f- exper- find this piece of you that needs reject- to be rejected. You have to find it. You have to then pry l- your identity loose from the payoff or the structure or the habit of being that is associated with it the negativity, 
and then reject it. Refuse to go there. Withdraw your willingness to go into agreement with those parts of yourself. Very powerful. What is it that can reject? What is it that can aspire? What is it that can surrender? It's not you. It's not the person. It's not the story of you. It's the belief in you, the need of you, the want of you, the preference of you. These are all, these are your problems. These are the problems. It is the divinity in you that can do this. Only if you keep turning to the divinity in you, if you keep remembering that this is not something you can do by yourself, if you can keep connecting to something greater than yourself, to bring forward the strength, the clarity, the capacity, the aspiration, the discrimination, the willingness, the acceptance that allows for aspiration, rejection, and surrender to be possible, are you? Once you access this quality of yourself, once you move into relationship with yourself, that quality of yourself, there is so much f- fulfillment, there's so much aliveness, there's so much willingness there, there is so much strength, there is so much capacity that wasn't there when you were still caught up in your adhara, in your ego, in the habit of you. He here now makes clear about the nature of the aspiration. It's not a weak aspiration. It's not a little blue flame. Right? He's saying it has to be stronger. It's not enough. If the divinity is able to manifest itself in us, we may have moments of aspiration, but if we do not know how to nurture its flame, and we don't know that that's what's occurring, we'll misinterpret it. We'll think it's just, I really love that movie. Or, wow, what a beautiful friend I just met, person I just met. You'll misinterpret the aspiration. will be converted into some form of human, pay off some form of human <coughs> experience without you knowing it. And it'll be snuffed out by the want and the need and the attachment and desire and the wish and the hope that comes with that quality of the Adhara, the quality of our person. So noticing what is the aspiration... You know, it's like, um, it can be inspiration. Inspiration is like an aspiration. There's an inhaling and an exhaling. <laughs> inspiration and an aspiration. <laughs> this re- inspiration is like receptivity. Aspiration is like action mode. It moves into action. It's the inhaling and then the movement. The pause and then the moving forward. So the inspiration and the aspiration is like a breath. And when we aspire, the nature of aspiration is it's dynamic. It has a quality of moving towards something. Aspiration, true aspiration, always moves to its source. It's always moving to what, which is the source of the aspiration, even while it actually arises from that same source within us. To feel aspiration is actually the experience of you and the divinity coming together. The longing for God is the divinity within you in relationship with the God that you've been longing for. They're the same thing. So you feed the aspiration by attending to the aspiration. You feed the longing by attending to the longing. And how do you do that? Well, you simplify, you reject, you take out of your life those other things that would distract you from attending when it comes. So that when it comes, you cherish it. When it comes, you shelter it. When it comes, you blow on it. You bring it. You give it more to burn. You build, you add tinder to the fire of your aspiration and and your longing. So it's this process of moving into relationship to the nature of aspiration 
it becomes then the mind's will. The mind can become a god. The mind says yes to aspiration. It says yes to the longing. It doesn't say, oh, how interesting, notice that. Or it doesn't assign distorted um, value to it, or what its source is. The mind's will, the heart's seeking, the ascent of the emotional nature, the reactive nature, the motivations, the will to open and make plastic the con physical consciousness and nature is pure willingness. It's this moving out of resistance into acceptance. It's moving out of separation into connection, out of relationship into relationship with that which you've not been able to be with. Rejecting those parts of you that are in the way. This is the mind's will. This is what he's pointing on, pointing to. It's the collaboration of all these parts of yourself. Any one part can be more mm, capable than another part. You may have one or two. Rare will you have all three. Any one of them. Maybe it's the discrimination that can first recognize what this is about and moves its intelligence aligned with that happening. But maybe it's the heart that just wants to have more of that and it moves into alignment. Or maybe it's just the incredible experience when the Shakti enters into your body that makes you plastic and receptive and willing to have it come in again and again and to stop when it does come in. Any or all of these can be the means by which we first enter into this truer relationship with aspiration. This part on rejection is just about pointing out what you need to reject. Just making it clear so you understand that it's not about your ideas, your preference, your hopes and your wishes. It's not about you becoming a light. It's not about this being the right teacher and not the right teacher. It's not about all the stories and information that you may come up with. It's about rejecting of the mind's ideas, opinions, preferences, habits, constructions. That's a lot of shit, actually, if you really wanted to understand what he was pointing to. It's everything you could think. So that a true knowledge may find free room in a silent mind. Rejection of the emotional nature, the vital natures, desires, demands, cravings, sensations, passions, selfishness, pride, arrogance, lust, greed, jealousy, envy, Hostility to the truth. Pretty good list, right? Gives you lots of material to work with. When you're looking at what it takes, what it is you need to be rejecting, this gives good clarity. You just read these words and the ones that say, no, I don't have that, then you know that's it. <laughs> oh no, that's not my problem. <laughs> be suspicious. This understanding, I call it correct information about the nature of the work, this is correct understanding. This is giving you the information that will empower the divinity in you to be able to come forward and take over this narrow, miserable, small, mean, petty part of you. The universe does not want you to suffer. Suffering is not a requirement. That's the human ego. This is your Christianity or your Jewish tradition or you know, your, your Puritan upbringing. It wants it to be effortless. It wants it to be a spontaneous unfolding. That was my experience. It was a spontaneous unfolding. It wasn't anything I did. I knew it right from the very beginning. The only thing I did was collaborate with it. The universe does not want us miserable. It just wants to be us. It just wants to be us, and in the process, we get to be it. It's a wonderful event. It's a wonderful thing if we could just recontextualize it. If we can recontextualize it, then you can begin to see that the more you let go, there's more space for you. There's more room to be. There's more relaxation. There's more peace. There's not as much misery and suffering and anxiety and stress. 
It's pointing to the technology of freedom, of recovering the divinity that we always were, but had forgotten for our human years and years of hundreds of lifetimes of embodiment. So that the true power and joy may pour from above into a calm, large, strong, and consecrated vital being. This is the purified vital. The purified vital is much more powerful collaborator than the mind. Because the vital has the drives. The vital also has all the strongest addictions to our human embodiment. And when it can be converted, when it can surrender, when it can release its hold on the world to be the way you think it needs to be, when it can release its hold on its grasping and its clinging and its demands and its insistences, when it gets off of it, when you got to let go of its competition and its jealousy and its envy and its defensiveness and its anger and its addictions to the lower nature, it becomes this great collaborator. It becomes the means in which divine can live as you. Not just know itself, but to live as you. And that strength, when the vital gives over to the divine grace, is the foundation of your manifestation as a divine channel. Rejection of the physical nature's stupidity, doubt, disbelief, obscurity, obstinacy, pettiness, laziness, unwillingness to change, tamas, so that the true stability of light, power, ananda, may establish itself in a body, growing always more divine. Surrender of oneself and all one is and has and every plane of the consciousness and every movement to the divine, to the divine, and the shakti. So you want to know where you are on the path? Just look at each one of these and see if they're still running your life. <laughs> your doubt, tamas. Your disbelief, your disdain, your unwillingness to accept. Your assurances in you know what is right. This is Thomas. Thomas is the basis of ignorance. It does not see its ignorance. It, can't, it does not know. It doesn't know. This part of yourself that is so right, it's unassumed, unexamined. You don't even know you're being right. All it knows is it's not that. You're wrong. You're stupid. It can't be right. It's also where we, all our superstitions lie. All our distrusts, our fears about betrayal or losing. It keeps all of these in its dark, dim, dim cabinet. And it's very tied into the body. And it's a deep and profound obscurity. If you ever notice Thomas' righteousness, they deny they're being righteous. Thomas is denial. Not, not the river in Egypt. It's the denial that there is anything wrong with you. Or it's the denial that anything can change. Or it's the denial that it can get better. It's the part of you that just takes a position. I'm screwed. It sucks. And without even you knowing you've got that position. It's where our core diminishment structures lie. So it's no easy undertaking to transform the physical nature's stupidity, doubt, disbelief, obscurity, obstinacy, pettiness, laziness, unwillingness to change. Very intelligent people could be this way. People who in every other way are wonderful, enlightened, awakened beings with followings and teachings. All I have to do is interact with them a little bit and then you discover where they lock down. 
where they say this is how it's supposed to be. You can see the physical, the physical tamas that's hidden underneath the glow of the awakening, the glow of what they've attained. I see, I've seen this endlessly. We had a person on the ashram who was living in this state of almost continuous merger in God. She, it just seemed like she floated, she was a ball of light floating across the ashram. And she was fully aware that she was a body of light floating across the ashram. And it was very appropriate that everybody bowed to her and told her how magnificent she was and how wonderful she was. And it wasn't until the teacher criticized her, questioned her assumption, she became outraged, rejected the teacher, rejected everything he was saying, just went from one to the other. And of course, she was living in the field of grace of my teacher. So as soon as she took that position, it all collapsed. But she didn't know it was collapsing. All she knew was how important it was to um, discredit my teacher. How important it was to speak ill of him. How wrong he was. How much he wronged her. That's where she ended up. Right. Not able to see the fact that this part of her, this obscurity in her that she didn't even know she didn't know just got revealed. And she didn't have enough discrimination to see that was what happened. I would sit and talk to her because I wasn't part of it. I was a, we were working together. I said, don't you see? He was testing you. He was just seeing it's how, what was left in you. No, no, that's not what he was doing. He was just being Righteous and judgmental, and you know, it completely wrong. And he didn't understand the sacrifice I was making. He had no appreciation for what was going on. He had no sensitivity to the people who I was bringing to him. How dare he? It was, it was impossible. And there was this rationalization and justification structure that came in that was indomitable. I literally couldn't be touched. Couldn't even have a conversation in the vicinity. I, and she was dear, a dear friend. But there was no opening. This hidden tamas had collapsed the possibility of the divine manifesting in her. And to this day, it's collapsed. Could never get up. Could never let go. <clears throat> so you have to surrender all of it. All one is and has and every plane of the consciousness and every movement to the divine and the shakti. Now how do you do this? Well in her case she wasn't in responsibility for her own experience. She was derived her experience from the teacher. She had not moved into collaboration. She hadn't started doing the work of bringing it into her personality. Getting clarity about the nature of how to collaborate with it. It was a natural opening that occurred for her because of her particular design. So it was much more kundalini, much more bottom-upper. So she had no discrimination. So when it, when she took the action, she couldn't even see the consequences of the action she took. So in this way, the nature of the spiritual path is very tricky. And unless we're consciously able to collaborate with the process, to have sufficient intelligence, no matter how tangible and powerful is your experience, it will not be able to hold on to it. You will not be able to discover that it's the divinity within you that's trying to come forward. You will not be able to discover that it's you that is collaborating with the divine within you, with the divine about you, or outside of you as the teacher. This is what he was teaching to the people who were coming to him. Because back in 1920s, 25, most of the people who were coming to him were Indians, and the orientation of the Indians was to surrender everything to the teacher and just live in the bliss of that. He didn't want these automatons. He didn't want these unconscious uh, devotional people. He wanted people who could become conscious channels for this force. So he was pointing to this, and the people he interacted with, he was working with. But if someone was overscured by this 
physical nature, stupidity, doubt, and disbelief, he had no entry. There was no entry. They had to have sufficient heart, sufficient intelligence, sufficient purity in the vital, sufficient purity in the intelligence, one or the other, and then this transformation could then enter into those parts of his being, their being, allowing for a greater and greater surrender over time. Because there's no doubt about it. This is the rest of your life. <laughs> In case you thought you could hang out with me for a few months and it'd be done. <laughs> Bad news. It's the rest of your life. You know, Sri Aurobindo's requirement was people had to give up their family, their relationship, their children, their money, everything they owned, all their possessions. They had to give it all up and they had to be celibate when they lived with him. And what they did is worked endlessly for free and they were given room, board, and um, uh, food, and, and health care. So they didn't have anything to go back to. It all had been stripped away. So even if they didn't understand what was going on with them, he was creating a situation where it wasn't going to be easy for them to run back to what they were familiar with or to their back. They didn't have a back door. And it was a remarkably effective tool. <laughs> I've always felt that I could assist you in your transformation if I just locked you into a windowless room and fed you milk and water periodically. You would go through everything that's left between you and Divine at some point. Very rapidly. You'd be a mess. <laughs> you may not be up to manifest. <laughs> you, you will definitely, at different periods, be extremely unhappy. <laughs> but whatever's left in you will be done. So this committing yourself to a process where there isn't a back door, where you put both feet in it instead of just one testing the water and if it doesn't feel right, you pull it back out, which is what most Western spirituality is. This feels good. Oh, it doesn't feel good anymore. This is wonderful. This is good. Ah, oh, no, I heard about this and I heard about that. Nope. Back out again. It's a mental, uh, the vital. <clears throat> we're doing it with everything because we're consumers, right? We only buy what we want. And we use it until we don't need it anymore and then we give it away or throw it away. Or it's, it is our weakness. We don't know how to commit. We don't, as a culture, create people who are have that inner gumption or strength to put themselves through an ordeal. Little less an ordeal where there's maybe not any evidence of progress or outcome. <laughs> that would call, be called stupid. <laughs> so if you see, to be able to have the right forces in order to move into relationship with this grace is a grace. To be able to have the capacity, the intelligence, the openness, the flexibility, the willingness, is a grace. And that quality in you that would allow you to do it is divine. Is the Shakti itself. Is the truth itself. In proportion, as the surrender and self-consecration progress, the sadhaka <coughs> becomes conscious of the divine Shakti during the sadhana pouring into him more and more of herself, founding in him the freedom and perfection of the divine nature. The more this conscious process replaces his own effort, the more rapid and true becomes his progress. But it cannot completely replace the necessity of personal effort until the surrender and consecration are pure and complete from top to bottom. Note that a tamasic surrender, refusing to fulfill the conditions and calling on God to do everything and save one all the trouble and struggle, is a deception and that and does not lead to freedom and perfection. So this is the nature of the surrender. The surrender is not possible unless divine has come forward in your system enough. You might say that the quality of being able to surrender <clears throat> is simply a willingness. It's just the learning to come, being willing to come to relationship to that which you don't want to be with. 
to come to relationship to that which you didn't know was true or didn't believe could be true or to that which you had created that to the falsity of the story about why it is the way it is the error in your perception this capacity of willingness is the entry point but willingness itself is a passive quality relative to what's required there has to be more than willingness there has to be actually the ability to commit to consecrate to devote to put yourself into the ordeal to put yourself into the process to stay with the process so that it can complete so it can resolve so without willingness and this willing and this ability to commit we can't hold whatever comes will go whatever progress we made will be fitful it'll be uncertain it'll be unstable because when the first grace comes we may have a very wonderful opening we may wake up out of our ego wake up out of our person but unless we have a willingness and a billing billing an ability to commit to a true change to an integral change then it'll get obscured through the process of being exposed to life and it'll reanimate our old identifications our old habits our old patterns of being and before you know it we can be awake but miserable and poignantly aware of how miserable we are without willingness without commitment nothing true and real can come because it takes the conscious collaboration of the adhara of the ego the constant willingness to put forward effort to collaborate with the process to allow it to come and grow instead of constantly come and go it's not enough you can't just be passively willing you also have to be willing to throw yourself into what needs to be done and that sacrifice that's uncomfortable that's like a death a moment by moment dying to what you had hoped to have out of life to all the wishes and the preferences and all the cherished moments all the securities and the comforts all of these need to be able to, you need to be willing to relinquish to let go of Now when you're around a teacher this was not a hard business to do because in the course of human life very few people are around someone who brings in a transformative force and if they are they usually can't tolerate very, very long they usually live at least 200 miles away preferably thousands of miles away and then the teacher's a romantic idea and for you get a radiant of that it felt the same as living in the cauldron and surround the teacher so when you're around the teacher none of these things can stay hidden for very long every nook and cranny of you is getting constantly pushed up because it's from the inside out the grace is is asserting itself because your willingness to be with the teacher your willingness to commit yourself to stay in the fire is all that's necessary for this to keep giving you more and more what needs to be rejected more and more opportunities for surrender for commitment for letting go but also more and more a direct experience of the divinity that you are so but when the surrender begins when we act, when a person i see a person moving from willingness into commitment into sacrificing into this capacity to endure calmly to persevere to hang in there to go through the their undoing I can see the divinity gaining more and more authority in the person bringing more and more capacity into the person and at some point there are parts that are just then surrender parts of the person not all parts surrender at once bits and pieces start surrendering and it starts making those parts of themselves able to be with the teacher more effortlessly they begin to reap the benefit they begin to feel more and more the divine satchitananda in themselves there's this greater sense of empowerment clarity and willingness and fulfillment 
So these stages are all necessary in order to bring forward true surrender. He's saying it's not this false kind of surrender. Oh, God, do it for me. Oh, teacher, do it for me. If I hang out with the teacher, if I hang on to the teacher long enough, the juice will carry me there. It's not going to do it. Not going to do it. If people hang around me long enough, they burn. The burning will do it, and then they'll let go if they're not committed, if they're not capable. It calls up all of us. It calls up all the parts of ourselves. It requires much more than the amount of ourselves we had to use to go through the course of life or to work out the, our relationships or to work out our security or money issues. It requires a much more dynamic mobilization of all the parts of yourself in order for this perfect perfection to come. And you can't do it for yourself. There's no way. You have to sense the purpose. You have to sense the divine intent that's behind all of this. Because unless you have a sense that everything that's happening to you is a sacrifice to serve something greater, to be of use to something greater, then you can't do this for yourself. I was talking to Sean today on our walk that what I noticed about being an architect is that trying to be an architect, striving to be an architect, was easy for me. The ambition, the willingness to work hard, the discovery and the exploration that was required, that was relatively easy. It was being an architect that I had a little capacity for. Once I got what it was that I was striving for, I couldn't find a reason to continue to do it. I kept looking for a reason to keep working this hard. It no longer had any meaning for me. Because it was still for me and I didn't have enough ego, I didn't have enough meanness in this to stay with it as a way of continuing to reinforce my sense of self or worth or importance or whatever it was before. But here, what's different here, is I have this tremendous strength to stay with this. It's not even a questioning. There's just resolve that it's not even, it's not my resolve that will stay with each of you way beyond your capacity to stay with me. This capacity to be with you in ways that you couldn't be with yourself. It's not mine. It's not the person. It's the divinity itself finding its voice through me, finding its way to be through me that can now maintain and hold the opportunity that has been revealed, that the nature of this work is. And it's service. And for me, it's not an idea that I serve the manifestation of the divinity in, in each of you. It is my, the whole organization for my beingness, for why I exist. This is absolutely the Dharma, the Satya Dharma, to manifest the divinity in each of you. And I have a great compassion for those who can't stay with the process. I know how difficult it is to come out of the habit of our embodiment, but I truly have the ability to stay with this as long as you stay with me. Where did this come from? This is not my strength. This is divine strength. It's not my love. It's divine's love. And all I can be is in awe of what this has become. So the surrender, this is surrender. This is when you are spontaneously, without thinking, without effort, without sacrifice, without questioning, without clinging, without needing it to be a certain way, an expression of the divine on the planet. Okay. That's the revelation of the second chapter of the Mother Book. May divine manifest in all of you. My love and grace go to all of you. 
Now let's finish with the meditation.